Lord, again, we just come to you and ask that you'll teach us by your spirit today. We open our hearts to your word, to understand it, to, to become excited about it, uh, to see how you, in fact, um, control everything, to bring it together, and to bring us our, our, the Bible right into our hands. And we thank you for that. We thank you for preserving the word for us and for our salvation. So that we may know you better. In Jesus' name, amen. That a girl brother. All right, so can you imagine what uh, the world would be like if we didn't have any books? Just think How many of you like books? Oh, wow. Do you like books? Do you like books? Okay. Caleb, do you yeah. like books? Yeah. What's your favorite book? My book I got from the library. Which one is it? This week is this Paw Patrol book. That oh, the, the Paw Patrol book you got from the library. Do you like books, Valerie? Yeah. Very good. Uh, Aurora, do you like books? Yeah, books are great, aren't they? And books teach us a lot of things. And, and uh, But did you know that there's one book that teaches us everything we need to know about life? Everything about living in this world and all the questions we have, is in the answers are in one book. Do you know what book that would be? Aurora, what do you think that book would be? The Bible, yes, exactly. No. <laughs> you like the Bible? You like the Bible? Good, Valerie. That's really good. Well, you know, it's a privilege to have such a book. Have you ever wondered where we, um, <clears throat> how we got our Bible? You ever wondered that? Last week I sort of hinted that this time, this week I'm going to talk about that, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to we're going to answer the question: Where did we get our Bible? How did we, in fact? get it today. <clears throat> and it all started back when God wrote the Ten Commandments. In Exodus chapter 31 verse 18 it tells us that, uh, that God uh, by his own finger wrote the, uh, the commandments on the tablets of stone and then gave them to Moses. Of course he went and broke them and had to redo it himself which probably would have been a lot harder than when God did it. The point is God wrote it down. And he told Moses to put it inside the Ark of the Covenant to preserve it so the people would never lose sight of it. How many of you remember the battle uh, with, um, uh, with uh, Amalek? Nobody. How many of you remember the battle where Moses had his hands up, and as long as they, had, they were up, they win, and when they fell down, they were losing? Okay, that's the battle of Amalek. Okay? And uh, <clears throat> when that battle was all over, and by the way, they won, Okay, that's Exodus chapter 17. God told Moses to write it down in a book. You see, God told them to write it down. Why? So that they would never forget what God did for them. So Moses wrote down all the words of God uh, in a book. And, and uh, in, in the text that we read this morning already, he told them to write it in a book called the Book of the Covenant. Exodus 24 verse 3 says... Uh, Starting four, Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord, and then verse seven. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it to the hearing of the people, and they said, "All that the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will obey." So you see, God communicating in a written form was important for God because He knew that the people would forget if they didn't have it written down. Now, of course, God had to make sure they kept writing it down because. Back then, they didn't have paper like we have, and it would wear out. And so they had to keep on writing it. So one of the things that God said in Deuteronomy 17 was he said, in speaking, Moses talking about the, the future kings, he said, uh, make sure that they all have a copy of the law. Um, copies that are approved by the Levites for accuracy. So in other words, Moses was saying, or God was saying through Moses, that all of the kings make, make sure they had a fresh copy and an accurate copy. So that meant that the Levites drove, and one of their jobs was to make sure that everything in the Bible, everything that's written down, was kept, was protected, and was always accurate. So they had to set up rules for rewriting it and rewriting it onto the new parchments so that it would be preserved. So this is what it's all talking about. Deuteronomy 31. When Moses had finished writing the words of his law in a book, 
To the very end, Moses commanded the Levites who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, take this book of the law and put it by the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for a witness against you. So it was really important. And right from the beginning, with the days of Moses, the people recognized that the Word of God in written form was extremely important. And preserving that Word in written form was also extremely important. So we call that the canon. Uh, the canon just means rule or um, uh, measurement. So it's, it's the measurement of everything that we do. So it, be, it is the Word of God. We also know that Joshua kept a record of all of the conquests of Canaan. And today it's in the, in the book of Joshua. Joshua. Oh, you're all so smart. You must have took smart pills this morning. Here's the coffee. <laughs> I, I didn't have any coffee. So. Yeah, so Joshua wrote it down, and he wrote down the, and somebody also wrote down the history of the judges for us. So it, it was, everything was written. Did you ever notice in the book of Kings, you know how we, when we read through the book of Kings, there was a phrase that came up after, every time they talked about so-and-so became the king, he was the king for this many years, and uh, then at the end it said, all of the rest of the, the rest of the things the king did were written down in the chronicles of the kings. Do you remember that? Okay. So their history was written down, and that wasn't something that just the Israelites did. Every nation did that. And that's why we have manuscripts, that's why we know about the ancient Egyptians, because they all wrote it down. Um, the difference is, is that there are thousands and thousands of manuscripts um, about uh, the Israelites and the scriptures, but there's very few manuscripts about all of these other nations. It's funny how we uh, accept that the other nations stuff as being absolutely 100% true and accurate, but we have, the world has problems accepting the word of God, but we've got thousands of witnesses in terms of manuscripts, isn't it? Well, so that this uh, the Chronicles of the Kings is referred to 33 times in First Kings and Second Kings alone. In uh, Second Chronicles chapter 34, verse 14, this is after a whole line of bad kings uh, who have forgotten God's law. Uh, they uh, basically never opened the book of the law ever again. Well, now we come to King Josiah. Josiah was, was one of the kings of Judah who, with the thumbs up. He, he, was, he followed after God, but also in the manner of David. And not all of the good kings did it in the manner of David, but Josiah did it in the manner of David, which means he got rid of everything that belonged to the foreign gods. In the high places, which the other ones failed to do. Yeah, that's right. So... Um, <clears throat> So King Josiah, he's cleaning up the temple, and he says, we've got to get back to worshiping God properly. And he's cleaning up the temple, and they find the book of the law. Uh, that is the book of Moses, the book that Moses wrote. And this is 784 years after Moses. So even during this whole time where they are, you know, they're not really following after God, at least somebody, uh, presumably the Levites, kept up their end of uh, preserving the written word of God. And there it is. They find it. And he opens it, reads it, and leads to all of the reforms that Josiah did in making the people come back to following God. Very important. I want you to look at something else. If you take your Bible and turn to Ezra chapter 7. Ezra chapter 7. <clears throat> so Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms. Ezra. Are we done? Are we done? No, we're not done yet, honey. Why? Why? Because <laughs> granddad's not done. <laughs> okay, Ezra chapter seven. Now, this is after the, the after the Babylonians, the Persians are now in control. And Cyrus has made his decree that, that the Jews can go back and rebuild their lives in Jerusalem. And we're, we're now just coming, it's, it's about 457, it's the de decree of Artaxerxes. And this is a really important decree because this is the decree that starts the, um, uh, the, the, the um, prophecy of Daniel for the 70 weeks. Nevertheless, in, in chapter 7, so Ezra is, is one of the leaders who's leading the people back to Jerusalem. <laughs> 
and his job is to rebuild the temple. He wants to get the temple rebuilt, and he wants to, to, to um, teach them the law of God. Look, verse 1 says that introduces us to Ezra there, and then verse 6 tells us that Ezra was a scribe skilled with the law of Moses and that the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. He, now, he was skilled with it, which means he had had a copy. In fact, if you look at verse 10, it says, Ezra had said in his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach it, uh, his statutes and rules in Israel. Then verse 14, it says, uh, um, it, it says, For you sent by the king and the seven counselors to make inquiries about Judah and Jerusalem according to the law of God which is in your hand. So Ezra actually had a copy. So how would he have had it? He had to have taken it from Jerusalem to Babylon. In fact, we can understand as you read further that uh, he probably not only took the law of Moses, but all of the books that they had, every, all of the records, so that we have the whole canon of the scriptures up to that time with him, and he's taking it back to Jerusalem. That's, what, that's what's implied there. God was not going to lose his word. So through Ezra, uh, he restores the written word by preserving it, even though they were taken into captivity, and the temple was destroyed, and the city of Jerusalem was destroyed. God still preserved his word. And this is 949 years after Moses. So they, they're doing a pretty good job of preserving it. Now, sometime after Ezra and Nehemiah, um, possibly as late as 400 B.C., uh, the uh, <clears throat> we have a, a person or persons known as the, the canonicer, the canonicler, the guy who put the books together, who actually listed them and put them all together and formed the divisions and the order of the books. And, and he put little commentaries on some of the books, like the at last few verses of, of uh, Deuteronomy are not written by Moses, but are added by this chronicler. And he says, he says there, he says, um, you know, we're looking for this prophet of Moses, but he hasn't come yet, even though Elijah's been here and, and, and others, and nobody has come that is, replaces uh, the prophet that we're looking for. So we're still looking for him, is part of the, the point there. So God has, has preserved everything. So this guy has, has put it together. So by the year 400 anyways, it is, it is absolutely certain that the Old Testament books have all been compiled together in a single document known as the, uh, the, the Bible, quotations at that time because that word didn't exist then, uh, of the, the Hebrew people. So it's lasted for a long time. During the, the time of the Persians, that was during the time of the Persians, but now after the Persians, the Greeks come to power. They come to power in about 331 B.C. And uh, they, they're in power for about 268 years before the Romans come along. And they have the greatest influence on society than any other uh, nation ever did. They had their philosophers, um, they had their, their literature, they, they were very intellectual, very philosophical. Uh, and uh, they, they got everybody speaking Greek. That was the most important thing. So what happens is, it became imperative that the, uh, the Word of God, the written Word of God, needed to be translated into the Greek language so that everybody could read it. Because not all the Jews uh, and the people in the land could read Hebrew. Okay? Most of them did. But it became, almost became lost uh, in terms of, of economics and, and daily living because everybody had to know Greek. So they decided that they were going to translate it into Greek. And they did in a book that is called the Septuagint. The Septuagint. Bless you. Bless you. <laughs> Thank you, Valerie and Caleb. The Septuagint. And the Septuagint, of course, became the very first modern translation of the Bible. At least modern in that day and age. Okay? So again, those people that kept, who keep saying, hey, we have to have the King James only, and these other translations aren't proper. Well, you know, there's the biggest argument right there, that even the King James was a translation. They, they just have to think. 
Anyways, uh, don't, let me, don't let me get on that. So we know that at the time of Christ, <clears throat> um, and right up into the present, that the Hebrew Bible maintained the structure, the threefold structure that we talked about last week, and that the, the books went from Genesis to Chronicles. We know that from what Jesus said, and we looked at all those, those verses. So in the previous lesson, we said that the law, the prophets, and the writings was the, can canonic the canonical structure of the Bible. So we're identifying that the Bible has structure and a purposeful structure. So when this canonical back in 400 BC put the Bible all together, the Old Testament Bible, uh, they put it in a specific order on purpose. And we're going to discover what that purpose is in another lesson, but uh, that became the approved uh, scriptures at the time of Christ, at least in the Hebrew scriptures. The other thing, though, is that this Greek translation, the Septuagint, was also popular at the time of Jesus. And the question is, what order of the books did it have? And we're going to come to that as well. So the very first blank that you need to fill in on your notes there is that God communicated his message about the kingdom of God and about Jesus through the structure. Structure is the word that you need to put in there. The structure of the Old Testament. Okay, so one of the things we have to be careful, because some people want to say the structure is God-ordained. It's not. It, it certainly was God-guided and God-approved. But the very fact that we're going to see this, that there are many structures and different orders of the books, uh, both the Old and the New Testaments, indicates that God wants us to see more than just the original structure. And one of the things I want us to understand is that the structure and the order of the books actually focus our attention on a different aspect of the book. So one structure will say, look, see this in the book. And another structure will say, now see this in the book. And another structure will say, you can see this in the book. And we would never have seen those other two things if we hadn't, didn't have those other orders um, or arrangements of the books of the Bible. So that's one of the things we're going to see. So it enhances our ability to understand God's Word. So we have the English canon and we have the Hebrew canon. And we're going to look at those two together today. So, uh, what we're going to do then today is we're going to compare the two arrangements of the books, the English order and the Hebrew order, and then we're going to answer the question, where does the English Bible arrangement come from? We've already shown that the, the original order is the order that's in the Hebrew Bible. So, if you want to take the first page of your handout number seven, the first page of your handout number seven, and it will say... On the top, the Old Testament canon. The page is numbered, so it's page one. <clears throat> so the first thing we're going to do is look at the differences in, in, in the, uh, the orders of the, the books, the differences. So the first difference is, and this is number one, point number one in your notes, the division of books. Division of books. So looking at handout number seven, you'll see that there are two tables. The top table is the Hebrew Bible. The second table is the English Bible. And uh, uh, the second line of each table gives us the division. So what's the division in the English Bible? The first book is called what? The first division? The Pentateuch. Okay? So that goes in your notes, the Pentateuch. Some people call it the law, but normally when we're referring to the English division, we don't call it the law, we call it the Pentateuch. Pentateuch means five, and how many books are there? Five. Pretty smart, eh? And you guys are so intelligent, you're getting smarter and smarter. Before you know it, I'll be catching up. All right, so the Pentateuch. What's the second division of books? The historical books. Okay, so there's 12 of them, ranging from Joshua to Esther. 
Right? Joshua is when they go into the, and conquer the, the promised land. Uh, by the end of Kings and Chronicles, they're kicked out of the land. And uh, then they go into captivity. But when they start coming back under with Ezra, and uh, then they're, they're, uh, they rebuild the, the temple. With Nehemiah, they rebuild the, the city walls. And then Esther just tells us that, that God preserves the people, even those that stayed back in Babylon. So that's the history, the historical books. The third division is what? The books of poetry, five. Okay, and then basically they look at the books and they say, hey, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Psalms, they're all written in poetry. So we're going to classify them. But they forgot the Lamentations of poetry, and a lot of uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah's poetry. <laughs> a lot of the prophets uh, is all poetry. And so they don't seem to do that. But nevertheless, we put those five as poetry. And then we have the last section, which is 17 books, which is the prophets. So Pentateuch, historical, poetry, and uh, prophets. Now the, the prophets, there's two, two sets of prophets. The first five prophets are called the major prophets, and then the next 12 are called the minor prophets. Okay, so that goes in your notes as well. So looking at the Hebrew Bible, we'll notice there that the Hebrew Bible is not a fourfold division, but is a threefold division, which we looked at last time, which you all are familiar with now, which is law, prophets, and writings. So that fills in your, your lines there under the Hebrew Bible. And if you look under the prophets, there's two columns under the prophets. Okay, the first column, it's not written there in the, uh, in the chart. But the first column, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings, uh, those, those are called the former prophets. The former prophets. And then the other ones, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the Twelve, they're called the latter prophets. Prophets. So just a division within the prophets. Just like we have major and minor, they have former and latter. So that's the first thing that you notice, uh, which is a noticeable difference between the English and Hebrew Bibles. The English has four divisions, the Hebrew has three divisions. And we're going to talk about why uh, in another lesson. And you go, oh, Okay, the second noticeable difference then, point number two, uh, you'll want to fill this in, uh, is the number of books. So the number of books is a noticeable difference. So if you, how many chap, how many books uh, do we have in the English Old Bible? 39. 39. So you all can read real good, right? How many in the Hebrew? 24. Okay. Uh, it could also be 22, and it could also be uh, 25, right? And uh, <clears throat> so before you think that we're missing books, okay, you look at the list there, it just says Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings. Before you think that we're missing books, but we're not missing any books. And that's because in the Hebrew, 1st and 2nd Samuel is one book. 1st and 2nd Kings is one book. First and Second Chronicles is one book, and Ezra and Nehemiah were originally one book. Right? And do and, and, uh, you see under the prophets there, it says Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, then it says the twelve. Right? Th that wasn't because I was too lazy to write out the twelve minor prophets. That's because in the Hebrew, the twelve was one book called the twelve, or the book of the twelve. <laughs> Okay? And there, was, there were no title divisions or breakups between the different prophets. But when we came to our, to come to our English Bible, well, we have them all written differently. We, now, we're all wishing that, that it was all one book because it's easier to remember um, the prophet or the, the, book of, the book of 12 than it is to remember <laughs> Hosea, a Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Dan, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Right? Okay, so the number of books is, uh, is different. So the, um, the important thing to remember, though, that is that, that uh, in the, the Hebrew 24 books, uh, it's exactly the same books that we have in 39. It's just that in, in their in terms of their scrolls, they're one. And that's, that's the issue here. The issue is um, the length of the scroll. 
So when they took the, the Hebrew scrolls and they started to write in, uh, in Greek, what happened is that they started going along and they discovered, man, this is too long. Because there was a standard length of a scroll. Remember, they have to manufacture these things and it's pretty difficult. And, and if you kept going and going, I mean, you could have scrolls over this fat. And you wouldn't be able to carry them in your back pocket like we do with our phones these days. So they had to make sure they stayed to a certain length. And so that became the issue. And, and so that's why uh, Samuel got split into two and King got split into two and so forth. Now what you need to understand is that for a lot of them, at least most of them, and I think that some of them are, are by coincidence, is that there was absolutely no logical reason for the split in the books. And you might have noticed that when you were reading, that you go, it does, this doesn't seem like a logical place to split the, the books. Uh, good case in point is uh, take 1 Kings and 2 Kings. He's starting at 1 Kings 17, we have the ministry of Elijah. Okay? And uh, that's during the reign of Ahab. And uh, we know that, that Elijah kept going and then he brought Elisha along and then God took Elijah away in the whirlwind, right? And then Elijah began his ministry. Well, Elijah starts in 1 Kings 17, but he's not taken up in the chariot until 2 Kings chapter 2. So it, 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 it logically would say, hey, the, the break should have been, 1 Kings should have gone to the end of chapter 2. That would have been the logical spot for it. But they ran out of room on the, uh, in the, on the scroll when they're translating, so they had to start a new scroll, um, even though it interrupted the ministry of Elijah. So that's how that, that worked. Um, <clears throat> so it's just, it, the issue there is length. Any questions on that? I understand that? Some of them, it, it appeared right, because for instance, at the end of uh, 1 Samuel, Saul dies, and at uh, the beginning of 2 Samuel, David acknowledges Saul's death and takes over. That kind of seemed like a good, good break, but it's probably more coincidence than anything else that just happens. Because they're translating along, and they got to the end of their scroll, and they were able to, to start the next book there. All right, so that brings us to point number three. So we have the number one, the division of books is a difference. Number two, the number of the books is different. And number three, the order of the books is obviously different. And it's a noticeable difference. The uh, Hebrew Bible starts with Genesis, the same as the English Bible, but it ends with Chronicles, whereas the English Bible ends with Malachi. In the English Bible, and you can see this on the chart as you're looking at it, if you look under the prophets, in the English Bible it goes Joshua, Judges, Ruth. In fact, that's how we remember it. We kind of make it into a sentence, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. Okay? And, uh, but in the Hebrew Bible, Joshua, Judges, Samuel. He doesn't judge Ruth because Ruth isn't there. Where's Ruth? She's over in the writings after the book of Proverbs. Now, there's a really good reason about this, and I'll give you more details about it uh, later, but Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, ends in chapter 31 with the picture of the awesome wife, right? The ultimate wife. And then it illustrates it by using the book of Ruth afterwards. Ruth is the illustration of the, of the beautiful wife of the end of Proverbs. That's sort of the reason that's behind it, part of the... Part of that. Now, um, well, I'll come to that later. Look at the, uh, some other differences in terms of the orders of the book. Um, so Ruth comes after Proverbs. Did you get that in your notes? Okay. <clears throat> You'll notice also in, the, in that the major and minor prophets in the English Bible, where do we put the major and minor prophets? At the end, isn't it? <clears throat> and it's major, then minor. We clump them all together and stick it at the end. But look at the Hebrew. What we would call the major prophets is in the middle, but there's somebody missing. Who's that? Daniel. Daniel. Daniel's missing out of there. And the Hebrews aren't looking at him as being a prophet. They're looking at him being a writer of encouragement, which is why he's in the writing section. And he comes after Esther. 
Asher, of course, seems to be way out of place in terms because we would think of that as a history book, but not to the Hebrew mind. So Daniel is not part of the prophets in the Hebrew orders. I'm going to come back to this later at another lesson to, to show you the thought patterns and the rationale here. But the point today is that we need to understand that there is a rationale. It isn't, they, they just didn't grab these books and say, okay, this is the order. They actually thought it through and purposefully put it in this order in the Hebrew Bible. And there is a rationale to it, and we're going to look at the rationale. I just indicated briefly about the rationale of having Ruth after Proverbs. <clears throat> but there's also a rationale to the English order. We, we don't just throw it out because the Hebrew is the oldest, and, and we can say there was, it, it was there by a rational reason. We don't just throw out the There is a rationale to having the English order as well. And we have to understand and know what that is. And we'll look at that at, at another lesson as well. Can't get it all into, the, into today's lesson. So, <clears throat> there's, uh, and there's an actual reason, a rationale, to why we have the, uh, what we know as the history books called the former prophets. There's a reason for that, and why there's the latter prophets, not the major prophets. So, former and latter, there's a reason for that. And when we understand that reason, we actually, the, the, the meaning and purpose of the books actually takes on a new um, uh, expectation and understanding for us when we're reading the Bible. And we need to know that. But in the English, it's also important to know why um, Daniel is put into the list of major prophets and, and uh, not split as the Hebrews do. So we, again, we need to... Both orders are actually very important for helping us to understand the Bible better and to interpret it better, whether it's the English or the Hebrew. So let's not get caught up on this thing about the, the Hebrew orders, the original orders, and therefore we've got to keep the Hebrew order. No, what I'm saying is it is one of the orders that God has ordained and we should not lose it or be unaware of it just because we only have the English order today. That's our problem today, is we have the English order, but not the Hebrew order. Until right now, you all have both in front of you, right? So, and uh, we're gonna learn um, <clears throat> what those reasons are. And it's gonna help us to understand the better, the Bible better. It's gonna help us to see God better. It's gonna teach us things about God that we didn't think of before, just because of the order of the book. And what comes before and what comes after is called scenes. So there's a scene between the Proverbs and Ruth, which I've already um, indicated. And between Ruth and uh, Job that comes after, there's a scene there. And so and we're going to discover those scenes. We, we wouldn't know those or understand those if we didn't have the Hebrew order. But there's also reasons why in the English order, uh, there's a scene between Esther and Job um, that we, we need to understand. And uh, usually, we, even our English Bibles, we never think of it that way. We just think, we've only been taught, well, learn the books of the Bible so that you know where the books are, so that when the pastor <coughs> says, turn to Obadiah, you know where to go. Or when he says, turn to Hezekiah, you know, hey, that's not even a book of the Bible, right? So, um, you, you know those kinds of things. And then we think, well, it's just divided between the Pentateuch, history, poetry, and prophets, and that's just a fun fact to know. But there's actually reasons to that, and which is very seldom taught in, in Christian circles, but needs to be taught. So we're going to come to that. We're going to come to that. Now you're all just jumping at the bit to get there, aren't you? So it's obvious that the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew order, is the oldest, the fourfold, uh, the threefold division is the oldest arrangement of the Old Testament. So the question is, where did the English arrangement come from? Okay, now before I answer that, I want to tell you something else. And, and uh, I, I debated giving you this information because I thought it was too much. But then I thought, no, you, you really need to know this. Because those that are pushing for us to, to get rid of the English order and only go with the Hebrew order, don't tell you this. And what it is, is that there are other orders of the Hebrew Bible. And uh, so if you take your, your hand out and you flip the page, so turn over to page two, you'll see there's two more charts. 
And the first chart is the Babylonian Talmud. Now this was written about 500 years after Christ. Okay? And, and by the way, and by, at that time, the Masoretic text, which is the text of the Hebrew Bible, is still the original order, the original Hebrew order, and it was still in existence at that particular time. But the Talmud, uh, it's not a Bible, it's, uh, it's the book that, that uh, records all of the rules and interpretations of, the, uh, of how to keep the law, but in it they list the books of the Bible, and uh, they list it in a different order. So you can see there that one of the big differences in the prophets is that Isaiah comes third. So in both the original Hebrew order and the English order, it's Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. In the Talmud, it's Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah. And they actually have a rationale for that. In the writings, do you notice the first thing there? Ruth jumped from being after Proverbs to being before Psalms. Now what possible rationale could they have for that? Well, here's, here's what it is. The book of Ruth ends with the genealogy leading up to David, and who wrote the majority of the Psalms? David did. And so what it did by putting Ruth before the Psalms is it was giving kind of a preference or, or an acknowledgement that David is a very, very important person in the life of the Jews. And, and these are his Psalms. Okay, he was, he's the king, right? Um, so that's kind of the, the rationale there. You'll also notice that um, um, that Job and Proverbs switch places. So instead of Psalms, Proverbs, Job, it's now Psalms, Job, Proverbs. Um, and also Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon switch, and Daniel and Esther switch. Okay, so, so there's a different order, and there's reasons and rationale for them. Look at the second chart. The second chart, um, uh, which is kind of a combination of, of some, several other manuscripts that have uh, that have that are in existence, and the, particularly the changes in the in the writings. So from the Song of Solomon um, down to um, to Esther, that changes the original order. So again, if you look at uh, the the Hebrew order, the original order it's it's Ruth, Song of Songs, Ecclesiastes, Lamentations, Esther. Whereas these books, it is Song of Songs, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, Esther. Now, the rationale there is that, you, you know how the, the Jewish people have all of these festivals and feasts, right? Okay. So, uh, at the Feast of Passover, guess which book they have to read? The Song of Songs. The Song of Songs, the, Song of Songs, the Passover is all about the deliverance from Egypt. Um, <clears throat> it's the Feast of First Fruits of uh, it is a uh, giving the grain offering, okay? and uh, the Song of Songs is is all about the love between two people, which is supposedly a picture of the love of the Israelites to God. And this Passover is their expression of love to God through the Thanksgiving offerings. Okay, at the Feast of Weeks, um, Shabbat, Ruth is read, and then the the, the uh, on the ninth of Av, it's not an official. Feast of Israel, uh, but it's a day of remembrance because on the ninth of Av, the temple was destroyed. <clears throat> and so they're mourning the loss of the temple. What is Lamentations all about? It's Jeremiah's book of, of mourning for the loss of the temple. So they read it. And then the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot, which is the next one, the Feast of Booths, again, the deliverance of, of Egypt. And uh, they read Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes says, life is meaningless unless you follow the sun. Okay? And, and the, the point is, is that just like when we were in Egypt, life was meaningless unless we followed Moses out. So we need to follow Moses. So the emphasis, the focus, is follow the Torah. And uh, so that's why it's read at the Feast of Tabernacles. Of course, for you and I, we want to follow the true sun. The true prophet who replaced Moses, who is Jesus Christ who delivered us not from Egypt, but delivered us in the second exodus from sin, so forth. And then, of course, the Feast of Purim, they read the book of Esther, uh, because uh, Purim, which means Lot, um, Naaman chose Lot to, to get the date to when he figured he was going to uh, kill, um, um, 
Mordecai and all of the Jews, and they were delivered. You remember that story. So that's why that is. So they've changed the order. It's called the, the Megillah, the five festival scrolls, and it's in the order of the feasts. So they had to change the order in the books. So again, it, it's, it's how they focus on That's their rationale to it. They're focusing on the feasts and what the, the feasts mean to them. So they change the order. And that again, that reminds us that then that the order is not... Um, is not the important, the original order is not the ordained order. If God can allow it, what is important is that there are different ways of, of uh, having the books. Uh, in, in some of the medieval manuscripts that were found, the book of Chronicles, which according to the Hebrew order is the last book, actually is the first book of the writings before Psalms. So uh, there's another difference that uh, has been found in some of the manuscripts. And again, there's a rationale for all of these things, uh, all of these variations. All right, so where did we get the English um, uh, order that we have? Where did that come from? Because that's really quite different than the Hebrew order. So we're going to look at uh, three things. We're going to look at the Codex Manuscripts. And the Codex Manuscripts are the manuscripts which are the surviving copies of the um, Septuagint. Okay, I knew that was coming, Caleb. <laughs> I told you I was going to say that word a lot, didn't I? Okay, it, so it's this, the copies of the Septuagint. So when they talk about the Codex manuscripts, they're talking about the Septuagint. When they talk about the Greek manuscripts or the Greek copies uh, the, or the Greek canon, they're talking about the Septuagint, just so that you, under, uh, you understand. Now, on, on the page two of, of the handout, there's, uh, at the bottom, it says important manuscripts. I've given you kind of a description. I'm not going to go through those today, but uh, those are there to, to help you. But in the, so the first thing is the Codex Manuscripts, the copies of the Septuagint. Here's the, here's the thing. We already discovered that the Septuagint was, uh, um, was tra translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek back in 284, something like 264 uh, BC. So it was quite a long time ago. But we, we don't have any manuscript, any original manuscripts. We have no idea for certain as to what order they put it in. It, it's, it's, we, we don't know if they followed the Hebrew order or whether they just made up a new order and why they did it. All we know is that all of the copies of the Septuagint that we have all show an order very similar to the English order. So somewhere between 200 AD and the, the oldest of these, uh, the youngest um, of these is about uh, 325, um, the Codex Vaticanus, uh, they all show an order which is similar. So if you look at page 2 then of your uh, handout, or page 3 of the handout, we have three of the four Codex manuscripts listed there in the list of the order of the books. Now, it, when you see, like, if you look at the middle table where it says Codex Sinaiticus, right, if you look under the historical book, books, you'll see some brackets. What the brackets mean is that, um, is that the complete book is not there. Only portions of the book were actually found in the manuscript. So the whole thing is not there. So if there's no brackets, it means it has the whole book. So th these were amazing discoveries that were found. The Codex, Codex Vaticanus was found in the... Um, the Vatican Library, and, and uh, oh, by the way, a, a codex is uh, just means a book. And uh, I didn't advance this, but here, here's a picture of the codex, codex uh, Sinaiticus. It almost sounds like I got a sinus problem. But um, on the on the Mount Mount Sinai, there is a monastery called Saint Catherine's Monastery, and uh, this historian was there one day, and, and he found in the dung pile of all things, he found this book, the Codex Sinaiticus, and uh, so there, there's a picture of it there, this is a, a picture of the Codex Vaticanus, you see it's no longer a scroll, but it's now in a book form, and, it, and, it's, and it's no longer papyrus, but, it, but it's valuable, it's uh, animal skins, right, and uh, this is the Codex Alexandrinus, uh, this was done in, uh, was found in, in Africa, in Alexandria. Okay, and you see again how they put it in columns, and it's all in Greek. 
Amazing how God preserved this. But the order of the books is as listed there on the three um, on the three uh, uh, tables on page three. But what I want you to see is that there are, again there's some really major differences even to the English Bible. So the first thing, if you look at the Codex Vaticanus, the first table, you'll you'll notice actually in all three of them that the Book of Ruth is back to being Joshua Judges Ruth. Okay. So despite all of the variety in the Greek lists, um, this is one of the major trends, is that Ruth is now always after Judges. In all of the, the manuscripts um, of, the, of the Bible after this, outside of any Hebrew ones. So anything in Greek, anything in Latin, uh, anything in any other language, Ruth now is always after Judges. And Chronicles is now moved from being the last book to being after Kings. That's another trend. So everything now has Chronicles after Kings. And Lamentations now is always put with Jeremiah. What do you think might be the rationale of that? Author. Awesome. Author, awesome, exactly. Jeremiah wrote uh, uh, Jeremiah and he wrote Lamentations. Okay, so they keep them together. And of course Daniel has moved from the, uh, the, the, the wisdom or the writings to, to its proper position in the prophets. Now, one of the things I want you to see here is, is again, that in our English Bibles, it's always the poetry books followed by the major prophets followed by the minor prophets. But you'll notice there in the Codex Vaticanus that it has the minor prophets first, then the major prophets, so the last book in their Old Testament is Daniel. Right? And there's a reason for that. The rationale is Daniel is saying, hey, there's these new these, these um, new." Governments that are coming ahead that have prophesied Kings Babylon, then, then Medo Persia, then Greece, then Rome. They're still in the future. Okay, they're still coming. So Daniel makes sense to be the last book. He says there's, uh, there's uh, uh, 70 sabbaticals left in terms of, uh, of when the, the Messiah will come. So it, it needed to be, it makes sense that it's the last book. Okay, but in, in here, uh, the, um, the minor prophets are, are, are first. And then, uh, of course, the other books, they all have um, uh, uh, the Psalms being the end, which is, which is quite strange. So the prophets come before the poetry books. And the Codex Sinaiticus uh, has, has the book of Nehemiah listed with the historical books but then it, it also has Ezra and Nehemiah listed with the prophets. So I did it twice. A little bit confusing there. But nevertheless. So we can see that, that even when it comes... So all of the manuscript evidence we have of the Septuagint is basically the order that we have in our English Bible. So can we conclude that that's where our English order came from? Well, not specifically. The one thing that it does tell us here is that the Septuagint order is actually... Pro, is pre-Christian. So it's probably before the church. Uh, even though the, these documents are about 3, 330 BC, or 330 AD, the church um, can, the New Testament can enclose 100 AD. There's one other, Melito, who was one of the early church fathers in the second century. Uh, he made a list of the Old Testament books in part, some of his writings which is dated about 170, so really close to the New Testament. And uh, he places the prophets at the end of the list, but follows it with Ezra and Nehemiah as being the last books, Ezra and Nehemiah, which makes sense as well, because they, they were, in fact, historically, the last um, uh, historical events before the New Testament. So those are um, some different things. So what we um, know is... oh. The, the minor prophets, uh, whether they're in the middle or at the end or at the beginning of the list of prophets, it's only the Greek canon, and that's what uh, um, handout number eight is all about. It, uh, it's a list of the prophets, which you'll see in the middle section, the book of 12, which is the minor prophets, and so there's an English order, a Hebrew order, and then the Septuagint, LXX is Septuagint, it's the number 70. But you notice that um, the minor prophets there, the last six are the same, no matter whether it's Hebrew, English, or Greek. Um, but the first six are different. And the reason there, you can see it, is 
Hosea and Amos were prophets to Israel. Micah and Joel were prophets to Judah. And Obadiah was a prophet to Edom. And Jonah was a prophet to Nineveh, to the Assyrians. And so they, the, uh, they um, doubled them there so they were the same. Whereas in the English order, we actually go um, Hosea, which is Israel, to Israel, Judah, Israel, Edom, Nineveh, Judah. So we'll kind of go back and forth um, in it. But uh, we'll talk. We'll come back to number eight again later as well, uh, just but just so you can see it. So we don't know if the Septuagint changed the um, the Hebrew order right from the start, or if it came over time. And the reason is we don't have any manuscripts prior to the Sinaiticus or the Vaticanus. We don't have any manuscripts before that. But obviously, by um, the time of Christ, that it had in fact changed. So. There, within that 200 year span, um, the order had changed. Um, we do know that within 70 years of Jesus, the manuscripts were showing that change. So that brings us to the second point. So the first point was the Septuagint, the Codex of Manuscripts. The second point is Josephus. The earliest known change uh, to the biblical order of books is actually found in the writings of Josephus. He was a Jewish historian at the time of Jesus and Paul. And in fact, he wrote, he was with the, the Titus, the Roman governor, when they, when they destroyed the city of Jerusalem in AD 70. Uh, somebody, they thought he was a turncoat, but uh, the, the Titus inscripted him to, to write about it because he was a good historian. So he made him work for the enemy, and nevertheless. But anyway, he was, he was he was having a problem communicating with his Greek friends, uh, his Greek-speaking audience, and he wanted them to he wanted to make sense of the Bible to them, and they and they couldn't figure it out because Greeks always think linear and chronological, and that's what you and I think as well. But Jews and Hebrews don't. They don't think that way. They they think thematic which is kind of a hint to the difference between the Hebrew order and the English order. And so he, he needed to get, uh, communicate to them. Well, he was having a problem with this Greek guy by the name of Appion. And uh, um, for whatever reason, whatever the problem is that Appion had, he, he wrote Appion a letter, and his letter was called Against Appion. That's a nice way to make friends, isn't it? Title your letter Against Appion. But it was a kind of a, an argument thing against his philosophies of life. And, uh, but in that letter, he actually listed the Hebrew Bible. Here's, here's kind of the reasoning behind it. He knew that his Greek audience loved literature, that they, they had the same type of literature as the Hebrews had. And so he's trying to connect with them. He's trying to contextualize uh, the Bible for them. And so he says to the Greeks, hey, you guys have your prophets. Here's our prophets. You guys have uh, your poets. Here's our poets. You guys have your histories. Well, here's our histories. And so he wrote it that way to the same way that, that the Greek mind would do it. So he puts the Bible roughly in this chronological order, which divides the books up by history, which would have been from Genesis to Esther, and poetry from Job to, to Song of Solomon, and then the prophets from Isaiah to Malachi. And that's how he gave it to them. Um, and that's what he wrote in his uh, in his uh, letter to uh, his uh, against Appion letter. He puts them in this basic order, and and, and you know the, the Greeks go, hey, now we understand. And now the Bible kind of makes sense to us because we got a book similar to that. I mean, our literature is is is, is like that. We have history. We got. Uh, prophets, we got poets, we, we, it, it, it makes sense to us. So um, Josephus lists the books in the basic English order, that's one of the blanks in the notes, uh, it, which is very similar to what we have today. Now again, we don't, we don't know if, if he got that from the Septuagint or whether he made it up. We don't know. We just know that he is the oldest reference to this order uh, in terms of even older than the manuscripts. So we don't know if these manuscripts and him refer to the Septuagint chains earlier. We don't know that uh, because we just don't have any manuscripts to tell us that. Okay, so that brings us to the third point, which is Jerome. And Jerome, he was probably the greatest Bible scholar um, who lived about 342 to 420 AD. Uh, uh, and um, 
and he was, he was the great scholar for about 400 years in the church. I mean, he, he did a lot in terms of scholar, scholarship. Well, somewhere around the 200s, because now the Romans are in charge, right? The Greeks aren't there anymore. The Romans are trying to get the uh, Italian, but it's not really Italian. It's Latin. They want the world to speak Latin. So then you end up, uh, with, you've got this whole pile of, of Latin manuscripts between the time of 200 AD to 400. The problem is, is these Latin manuscripts are full of errors. And uh, uh, particularly the older they got, the more errors came into it. Because people were translating it with their own opinions or making it the way they wanted it to be. And so um, the Pope... Pope Damasus the first at that particular time, he comes to Jerome because he's the smartest of all of their scholars, and he says, we need you to put, um, to give us a Latin uh, text of the whole Bible that we can use as being authoritative. So he puts the, he, he uses all of the manuscripts from the Septuagint, he uses the manuscripts from the Masoretic text, which is the Hebrew, and uh, he translates it all into Latin, and it's authoritatively and accepted by the church as the authoritative text of the church. And what is that called? Anybody know? Vulgate. The Latin Vulgate. And this became the official Bible of the church for a thousand years. So it's hung in there really good. So the Latin Vulgate, the thing is, he, he's using all these Greek manuscripts, which is the English order, but he's also using the Hebrew manuscripts, which is the Hebrew order. So it, it's, it's really interesting. But what does he end up? The Vulgate is the exact order that we have in our English Bible today. And that brings us to the fourth point, which is the King James Version. And, and I know we're kind of skipping a whole bunch of English Bibles. Okay, in fact, the very first English Bible was a translation of the Vulgate. Uh, which was, um, if I remember right, it was Wycliffe's translation. Don't quote me on that one. But anyways, in 1604, King James I of England, he comes to the, uh, to, uh, uh, he says, hey, I, we, we need an English translation. And uh, so he authorizes the, um, the translation into English. So they this group of men get together, scholars, and they use the, tr the manuscripts of the, uh, of the, the uh, Septuagint and the Hebrew manuscripts and the Vulgate manuscripts, and they, from that they come up with the King James Version. And that becomes the official church of the Church of England. Uh, the thing is, one of the interesting things is he uses, they use the Textus Receptus, as a major document. And the Texas Receptus is during the, the Reformation, Erasmus took all of the, the, um, the, the manuscripts at that time and created a Greek New Testament and called the Texas Receptus. And that's what they used to, to, um, to make the, the King James. The only problem is that the Texas Receptus um, got outdated when they discovered more manuscripts and was replaced by the West, West Cohort. <laughs> I anyway, know I'm getting too complicated now for you. And the West Cohort was re replaced by the, uh, um, the the United Bible Society, which is, and I'm going to show you a copy of that next next time. But anyways, but that's where the problem comes and the differences between our modern <coughs> English translations and the King James, and their whole thing is, hey, you, you're you're removing the blood from this verse well, it's because when you look at all of the new discoveries, it's not there. So anyways, it's part of it. Uh, by the way, the first 1611 version of the King James had all of the apocryphal books in it. It wasn't until the 1769 version that the King James removed to be apocryphal. Okay, so that's, uh, that's an important fact. So when we talk about the King James, we talk about the 1769 and not the 1611. Well, that, that's where the English arrangement came from. It's the arrangement that's adopted by the King James. So, so in a sense, it went from Josephus to Jerome to King James and then to us. And the Septuagint obviously played some kind of role, but we don't know what the role was in it. So once you get a, a traditional translation, once you get an official arrangement, and you get the printing press, well, things kind of become standardized, don't they? So that every Bible that is printed now is printed in the exact order that we have. So that's where it came from. Does that make sense? 
Does that, that uh, hopefully that taught you something you didn't know before and kind of puts this all in perspective. But here's the conclusion. See? The conclusion. Okay, the, the very fact that books like Ruth and Lamentations and Daniel, that they can be placed in different positions in different order in the Hebrew Bible and in the Greek Old Testament, it shows to us that the book order reflects um, to the, re the reader's perception of what the book is all about. Because the different orders helps us to focus on something different. And the thing is, is we would never see that point if we didn't have the different orders. And so the more orders that we have, the more um, valuable it comes to us in terms of knowledge and of understanding. Now we can get ridiculous as well by making up orders, so we have to be careful that there is logic to it. Again, I mentioned the, the fact of Ruth, that after Proverbs, it's, it's the fig, Ruth becomes the example of the good wife from Proverbs 31. But when it's, be, uh, but when it's after Judges, and before Samuel, it takes on a new picture. Because after Judges, it, it says, hey, look, at the Judges were a mess. We would have hope here through, through people like Ruth. Who, who have remained, remained faithful. Um, but we also have the, uh, the providential preservation of the, of the family. And, and, you know, and, and even Naomi, who was Ruth's mother-in-law, she had lost her sons. It looked like the family was going to die out. And you're wondering, what is the future? What's the hope? And when we come into Samuel, it begins with um, Naomi, uh, not Naomi, um, Hannah, the mother of Samuel. And she's old and she hasn't had any children. She wonders, where's the future? So we have that connection, and then Samuel is born, and she dedicates him to God, and uh, he, he begins to have the same life as, as Ruth had, and then what happens? He ends up being the one who, who um, um, anoints David as the king, who is the great-great-grandson of Ruth. So it's kind of neat how it all, all fits together. And, and again, when Ruth is before Psalms, it's kind of that introduction to the genealogy and acceptance of David as being the greatest king ever. So where a book is placed relative to other books is really important. And we shouldn't just pass it off. We need to understand the hermeneutical implication of it. We need, to, we need to know the rationale behind it. Because it helps us to understand and see something new that we've never seen before. And that's where we're going to go in the next lesson. We're going to look at the rationales and the scenes between these books and, and uh, why they're in this spot and so forth. Uh, does that sound like a place you'd like to go? Yes. Oh, thank you, Joe. I appreciate that. Okay, so that's our lesson for today. And I hope that you are more excited about God's Word than you were when we started. <laughs>